you've had an exciting winter. I've been really impressed with all of your actions in India. I'm so grateful to you for helping to spread the word. Yeah, I rattled a lot of people and the uh, matter reached a high. Anyway, so to come back to this uh, issue of uh, the paper from uh, Antonu and, and uh, Minesh, I don't know how to pr uh, pronounce that name. So it looks like geared to particularly malign your work, probably with the idea of uh, of uh, proving to the world that uh, there's nothing wrong with glyphosate and it can be reapproved and continued to use. Uh, I can't see any other purpose to make a paper of that kind, which is, seems to be absolutely focused to... Uh, well, anyway, what do you have to say? I am actually totally puzzled as to what is going on in their heads because they did an experiment that I believe is actually quite elegant and quite successful, spectacularly successful in identifying specific glycine residues that were substituted by glyphosate in specific proteins. And they put that information into the paper. I'm like astonished that they did that. Their I'm own paper actually contradicts their own uh, headline of the heading of the paper. Yeah, so what they, you know, you know their argument, right? And of course, that the, the sustainable pulse thing didn't mention anything about the fact that they actually found glyphosate in proteins. Did you notice that? The sustainable pulse article is quite short. And they just said, oh, yeah, these guys proved it. There's, that's the end of the discussion. You know, they left it all out. But the paper, did you read the paper? Uh, no, I have read only part of it. I have not read the full paper yet. It, it, it's difficult. It's, it's, it's written obtusely, I would say. It's a very difficult paper to read. Mm. But they do go into quite a bit of detail about their methods, and their methods are very common. It's a technique that's used. I actually wasn't aware of it before. The tandem, uh, I, forget, I always forget the rest of it, but it starts with the word tandem. Anyway, the me method that they use, tandem math, uh, <laughs> I don't know why I can't learn that. Tandem mass something or other. Anyway. Mass spectrometry, um, the method used? It is. It, it does use spectrometry, but uh, tag. Tandem mass tag. <laughs> I oh. got it one word at a time. Tandem mass tag. I think that's what it's called. But it uses spectrometry, and it's able to... Um, and I had been aware that they have been able to detect phosphorylated serines, which is the same thing as glyphosate, really. They're, so proteins get modified after they're made. It's called epigenetics. You know, mm -hmm. you've probably heard of epigenetics. Yes, of course. And one of the modifications that's common, very common, is to stick a phosphate on certain uh, amino acids, serine, threonine, and um, trip, no, tyrosine. Tyrosine, serine, and threonine can all have get modified by specific enzymes to stick a phosphate onto them. Okay. And if you do that, then the protein is going to be heavier than it would have been without that phosphate, right? It makes sense because it's got an extra piece on it, okay. the phosphate. So they have developed sophisticated techniques, which is this tandem mass tag, mm -hmm. you know, stuff, to be able to find a heavy serine. And, and, and it's heavy exactly by the amount you would expect if it had a phosphate attached to it. They okay. know how much it should weigh. Okay. So they can totally find specific serines that have phosphates, and they do that to try to figure out stuff about what happens if you do it and is it, you know, did it happen here? Because there's a lot of different ways that proteins change their behavior if they get one of these phosphates attached to one of their serines. They can either become more active or less active. I mean, lots of different things can happen to a protein if it gets a phosphate attached to a serine. And I'm well aware of that because I've been interested in the idea that glyphosate simulates serine phosphorylation because glyphosate has a methylphosphonyl group, which is very similar to phosphate has the same biophysical properties. It's mm -hmm. going to make the protein more water-soluble, which is what the phosphate does on the serine. So if glyphosate were to substitute for a glycine that's next door to a serine that's supposed to get phosphorylated, that protein will appear as if that serine is always phosphorylated. It'll look the same. Very, very similar, you know? Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, but is there an yeah. advantage in making it more water-soluble? Yeah, glyphosate is substituting for glycine is actually messing up hydrophilic, hydrophobic regions and making them hydrophilic, making mm. them water soluble. That's what's causing amyloid beta to get messed up. It's becoming more soluble because glyphosate is substituting for critical glycines in the place where amyloid beta normally goes into the membrane because it's not water soluble. Mm. And it no longer can go into the membrane. Instead, it becomes a, mm. a water soluble problem in the cytoplasm. That's what causes Alzheimer's disease. That's glyphosate substituting for glycine in amyloid beta. 
And that's why we have an epidemic in Alzheimer's exactly corresponding to the epidemic in glyphosate usage. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, um, so the neat thing about their paper, it's just the coolest thing. I w you cannot imagine my excitement when I realized, and you may not have noticed this, I was reading the paper, struggling with it, it's hard to read, I wasn't sure, I didn't understand what, you know, all the stuff. But they basically have that figure three, which is spectacular. Figure mm -hmm. three has 16 boxes. And each box has tiny print above it. You can barely see it. Do you see the print? Have you looked at the paper? The figure three yes. is an important part of the figure of the paper. Yes. Figure three. It has these 16 boxes with these different uh, heights of these different things that are showing up in both the treated group and the control group. That's the whole point. They say, ha, 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 because it happened in both the, the cells that were exposed to glyphosate for six days and the ones that weren't. Well, why would it be in the ones that weren't exposed? They weren't exposed, therefore they shouldn't have any. That's their argument. But they were exposed. They all were exposed for their entire life because they've been feeding them glyphosate-contaminated nutrients all their life. Mm. They've all been exposed. They've all accumulated proteins because those proteins that are contaminated with glyphosate become difficult to break down, so they stick around. So they shouldn't have expected much of a difference between an extra six days, you know, compared to however long those cells have been living. They came from some woman's tumor at some point, and then they've been maintained in culture all this while, feeding them these amino acids and uh, sugars that are contaminated with glyphosate. That's the explanation that makes sense, because they found perfect matches. It's incredible. If you think of the probability of discovering particular amino acid sequences, the exact sequences are 8 to 23 long, because it's different lengths for the different ones, of exact amino acid sequences with exact places where glycine was substituted by glyphosate. 16 of them, right? Hmm. To find 16 such sequences that all turn out to be exact matches to human proteins that are showing up in breast cancer cells, the probability of doing that by chance, of all those things being errors, is zero. It's absolutely zero. Hmm. That's why I'm so excited about the paper. They have proved, not only have they proved it, but they've pa paved the way so others can go ahead and look at other different things. You know, Anthony's horse's hooves could be analyzed. You could get some amyloid beta plaque. You could get some skin lesions from someone who's got scleroderma. You could get t more cancer tissues, and you could get some bile acids, all those things. You could get some blood, and you could run them through the same procedure, and you'd find all kinds of proteins that have glyphosate substitutions that are specific. Mm, I'm looking at this uh, figure three, as you mentioned. So, in other, in other words, one could uh, thank Anthony for himself doing the work in proving himself wrong. Right. Exactly so. This is why I'm so grateful that he did it. He, he not only proved that he's wrong, but he also showed people how to do it, how to, do, how to repeat his experiment. So now anybody on our side who has the resources can repeat his experiment on different tissues wow. and find more. And the thing is, he even found the appropriate ones, because I've actually developed a theory for the circumstances under which glycine would be more susceptible to glyphosate. And in particular, I wrote a whole chapter. I'm working on a book, you know, on glyphosate, and I, I'm working really hard on it, and it's really difficult, but it's coming together. And there's a whole chapter on phosphate, phosphate binding. Proteins that bind phosphate are especially susceptible to glyphosate contamination, in my opinion. And that is what EPSP synthase is. You know EPSP synthase is okay. the one that's famously disrupted. It binds phosphoenol pyruvate. And it's the place where it binds the phosphate of phosphoenol pyruvate that has the absolutely conserved glycine residue that if you take that residue out and make it alanine, all of a sudden that protein is completely insensitive to glyphosate. That is like so perfect to say, well, how do you explain glyphosate messing it up? Well, of course it's substituting for that glycine at the place where phosphate binds. And it turns out and I've read a lot of literature, they have recognized that there's a particular motif or a pattern that is a characteristic of places that bind phosphate that has to do with a glycine, almost always a highly conserved glycine residue, and then some positively charged amino acids nearby. And so it turns out that nine out of the 16, and there are only 15, 15 proteins that they found, nine out of the 15 bind phosphate the ones that they found in that paper. In other words, it fits my theory. Hmm. You know, they bind different different uh, small molecules that have phosphates in them. Nine, nine out of the 15 is pretty amazing hmm. to me. Hmm. And furthermore, they're, um, 
six out of the 15 have a positively charged amino acid exactly to the right of the glycine, which is where I would predict it would be especially vulnerable, and nine out of the 15 have a small amino acid to the left of the glycine. And my, and my analysis says a small amino acid to the left and a positively charged amino acid to the right is the best circumstance under which glyphosate is going to substitute. In other words, they identified high probability of a pattern that I predict would be especially susceptible to glyphosate. So they, those, those 15 proteins that they found are amazing. And mm. plus they have all kinds of interesting roles in the body, which I have to ch chase down mm. because that'll take some time. But it's, I was, you cannot imagine my excitement. First of all, when I figured out that I, I was looking at that tiny print above each, ca you know, each of those 15, 16 boxes. Yeah, and yeah I, really I was hard like, what to is read. This? You not, can't read it. I was like, yeah, what is this? And they, and they also didn't really showcase it. They just put I mean, miraculously, really, they put it there because they, I guess they felt they had to give some kind of an identifier to each of the boxes they were showing, right? And they were hoping that nobody would notice it and nobody would be able to read it. You have to blow it up to be able to read it, and luckily it's still legible, you know? Uh, some A, A, Q, T, E, G, I don't know what they mean, you know? Yeah, so what, what you do is you take that sequence of letters, and you take away that they have sometimes a parenthesis pH, that means it's a phosphorylated serine, for example, and they have a parenthesis G paren A2, that's the glyphosate substitution. They have a G paren A2, that's a glyphosate substitution. Oh. But you just get rid of the A2, just keep the G. And if you see an S paren pH, you get rid of the paren pH, just keep the S. In other words, throw away everything that's in parenthesis. Oh. And just type oh. those capital letters into that into that link that I sent you, which is the um, the um, Uniprot has a... Yeah, uh, you wrote down, uh, not only, you also wrote to Anthony with a, a long chain of... Uh, uh, right, I wrote down all the all the proteins that those every single one of those sequences that they found is an exact match to a human protein as a top hit. I mean that is amazing in a database of proteins for all different species. The number one hit for all of those fifteen that they gave is a exact match to a human protein. It's unbelievable. How could you find all those substituted glycines so perfectly? By mistake, you can't. It has to absolutely be true. And the reason, the way to explain it is to that both true. sides have it. I mean, they're saying, oh, because the control cells had it too, therefore these are all spurious. Well, that's ridiculous. They, the control cells have been expa exposed to glyphosate all their lives. I mean, I think we're all, we've all got glyphosate in all of our tissues, mm. without exception, all of us. Mm. You I'm know? Just, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, Anthony was saying that he's going to check the very glucose that they were using to feed the control uh, uh, control yes, cells. Yes, Anthony's going to test it. I'm really glad that he's going to do that. And he also even ordered the glucose. First of all, the actual feed nutrient that they used. He has uh, he sent, sent that picture. I was so thrilled. And the um, and the glucose that is that is sourced to make that is, I think is what the other thing is. He's hoping that'll have a higher concentration. But I'll bet it's in the amino acids. That is a high. That nutrient has high glucose, high amino acids, and the, mm. if you get the you get the amino acids by breaking down proteins, and you can't take the glyphosate out of those proteins, mm -hmm. I'll bet you the amino acids have glyphosate in them. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. Anyway, thanks a lot. We'll stay in touch. It it was good uh, touching base, and have a good flight to Boston. Thank you. All, All right. right. Bye bye. Bye. Okay. So that was my talk with uh, Stephanie Seneff. And those of you who do not or did not understand uh, the, the issues with regard to control, uh, control samples being contaminated and so on, I can tell you very briefly what this all means. When you do a lab test to check if glyphosate is, for instance, getting inside uh, animal tissues and so on, one of the ways to do it, like these guys did it, is to use two sets of identical samples, let's say uh, lab animals like mice, identical, uh, let them uh, live identical lifestyle in the lab and eat identical food. And one of them should be completely free of glyphosate. The other one should also be free of glyphosate at the start of the test, but during the course of the test, they are exposed to measured amount of glyphosate while the first group is not. The first group is called control, the second group is the test animals. 
subsequently as the test progresses and you keep testing uh, samples like that tissues that their blood chemistry or, or whatever if you find increase in glyphosate in the second group and not in the first group which is supposed to be clean then you can uh, um, uh, a report that glyphosate is accumulating in the in the tissues and so on also if the second group uh, develops some diseases that's not uh, happening to the first group although they live exactly same lifestyle and they are identical animals to start with uh, one could conclude that glyphosate is probably the trigger for all these new diseases uh, the the thing to remember is that one has to ensure that the control animal is actually free of glyphosate before you do the testing as is the second group before you start the testing. If you have not checked it and they are already contaminated with a lot of glyphosate, your test is all bullshit and there is a famous saying garbage in garbage out. So, if the animals have been exposed to glyphosate all their lives and then you bring a bunch of them separate them into two halves and one of them you assume to be clean and the other one you you feed some uh, small doses of glyphosate for two three weeks and you you expect to see massive difference no you won't because both of them are heavily contaminated how do you know that the, how does one know that they are contaminated well first of all you have to test them which you didn't second People like Anthony Samsel and all have been testing both the lab chow or the food that is commercially sold to lab animals as well as food that is given to farm animals. He has seen the amount of glyphosate in them because they are all uh, made of, uh, of uh, genetically modified and, and glyphosate uh, sprayed uh, crops and he has seen that it does bioaccumulate into farm animals he has been tested their tissues that their haunt their hooves and, uh, and people's nails and so on so it is known that it bioaccumulates except of course organically grown animals where you know from you are you are you are making sure that the, the whatever they eat has no glyphosate so if you do this kind of wrong test which these guys did and then they say hey uh, there is no difference between one and the other. I mean, we are seeing some traces that looks like glyphosate, but since the control animal is showing it, it must be a mistake. And the test animals also showing it, also a mistake, and same mistake. So, the, the, actually, glyphosate does not enter anywhere. This whole thing is all crap, which is what these two uh, scientists are not only saying, but the, they are going to prove it. All, they are also writing about it, and they are going to prove it too. And this brings us to the last uh, issue who is funding these people if you trace that you will find out that these groups that are funding this kind of uh, research have an ulterior motive to give you the false impression that you know there is nothing wrong with glyphosate the few scientists that are making noise they are just basically stupid or they do not know what they are doing and so on. So, be careful that is it I am done for now.